Hi, welcome everyone to the launch of the web project uh, Disrupt and Reflect. Um, I'm Nadine, I curated this project for Impact and uh, collaborated with Fontis, where I run a research track on digital cultures. And I also work as a program manager at Streip, an arts and technology organization in Eindhoven. And um, I started this project out of my research interest in the effects of the digital on our lives and especially the addictiveness to digital stimuli, um, which leads to distraction, information overload, and also strategies to cope with this, like mindfulness, yoga, free uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi free safe heavens, um, offline retreats, or um, compensation strategies, like um, the humane technology. Uh, movement promoted by what seems like, yeah, what seems like converters like Tristan Harris, who you might know know of the documentary The Social Dilemma. Um, and of course, as most of the time in uh, my case, I'm also my yeah own research subject, and uh, my personal struggles with digital uh, distractions and a lack of focus uh, on the one hand and. Also, um, at the same time, my love and fascination for the amazing uh, world of digital technologies and the internet uh, were also part of this uh, motivation. Um, so I started this um, project together with uh, Ion Dunnewind um, by talking about these fascinations and um, it was the idea to have a small physical uh, evening program, but it turned out into quite an extensive uh, curatorial research project with almost six hours of uh, video interviews with nine persons and seven commissioned uh, presentations by artists and designers and um, one of them by theorist Gerald Moore. Um, and the design of the web project was made by design duo uh, Teosh, who successfully uh, created this overstimulating web design. And today's launch is actually a packed program, um, but no worries, we, we, we don't have a break, but we have a calming intermezzo. Um, to give you a brief overview of what to expect, we kick off with a presentation on uh, dopamine as a metaphor of our age by uh, Geert Lovink, after which I will talk with him about uh, dopamine and uh, feelings in the digital age. And after that, we will have a guided meditation by artist Annika Kapner. Um, I will present some first results on the questionnaire uh, that we did at about our digital habits. And then we will have a dynamic Q&A, a live interview roulette with the contributors um, to, to the web project um, that are Roos Groothuizen, Tios, uh, Vanessa Bartlett, Katriona Beals, Dasha Elina, uh, Annika Kapner, Geert Lovink and Gerald Moore. Uh, they are here, but you don't, you cannot see them yet um, in this online metaverse that I feel like I'm in at the moment. Um, but no worries, after uh, all of this, you can um, go to the bar, have a drink and um, yeah, obviously an online bar. Um, but now I'd like to welcome Geert Lovink, uh, who runs the Institute of Network Cultures in Amsterdam and has written many, many critical books on the internet from the early stages up to now. Um, his latest book is Set by Design. And um, you can ask your questions to Geert in the chat on YouTube or uh, via email. And um, if you want to use the email, ah, there you can see it's questions at impact.nl. And I will teleport them into the uh, live stream. Um, so welcome to Geert. I hope he's there. Yes, yeah. I'm here. Yes, welcome. Hi, Geert. Hi, Nadine. Hi. Hey, hey. I, the floor is yours now. Um, and then after a few mi minutes, uh, I'll get back and we'll have a discussion. Welcome, everyone. Um, this um, short introduction um, takes us uh, right into the um, in emotional landscape uh, of uh, of today, um, which is uh, of course dominated by uh, COVID and lockdowns, curfews, but um, uh, the um, <clears throat> the 
yeah, the the emotional uh, bandwidth, uh, you know, has been really uh, explored already for for years. So this the sad situation we're in uh, right now uh, has been uh, with us for quite some time. Um, <clears throat> and um, as the Nadine said in uh, in my work, I've been uh, exploring. Uh, you know several of these uh, states of mind and uh, mental uh, well-being or mental mass uh, to be more precise uh, the dopamine um, yeah is uh, something that uh, you know uh, people don't really look at uh, so much people don't uh, you know as you know people don't study cocaine they don't study heroin they they study the abuse uh, and what we're confronted with uh, it's not so much, um, you know, the, the few minutes uh, of joy of one individual, but um, uh, the overall impact uh, on that person. Um, so dopamine indeed, uh, you know, is a, um, is a metaphor uh, for our, our time. Uh, we are uh, driven by it, as Nadine said, but um, uh, it is not, uh, unfortunately, our... Um, you know, dominant current state uh, of mind, if only, that would be good. Um, we get a kick out of, uh, you know, the likes that we receive, um, the people that uh, quickly respond to us, uh, the positive um, feedback loops, the encouragements, um, and especially also the, uh, the automated and uh, computer generated ones. Uh, and anyway, these days we can no longer uh, distinguish uh, between the two. Um, with Nadine, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the variety of the landscape because uh, it's really uh, opening up now. Um, in 18 and 19, I focused very much on sadness in particular as a kind of a, very superficial uh, state of mind that we cannot really define. It's quite diffuse. Uh, we're often uh, confronted by it. It's not a medical person. It's not like depression or burnout, which are really bad. So it's, uh, it's another state of mind. I'll read a little bit uh, about it uh, and then um, um, we'll... Uh, discuss uh, this um, together um, with Nadine. Let's get into social media weariness, the cause of our tired eyes. What are the techniques of resignation that we are exposed to? The blissful ignorance after browsing an entire ecosystem of narratives surprising culture is a pendulum and the pendulum is swaying the organized hard-coded in online advertisement likes and other things turned out to be merely producing anxiety as Carolyn Coles Richard stated what can't be cured, must be endured. The suffering, sorrow, and misery being tagged and filtered by our own of censorship. We and feel frozen. What we receive is the anger and anxiety of the online other the growing imbalance in the distribution of digital and is not causing a revolution or revolt, nor does it fade out. Welcome to the great stagnation. We, the online billions, are stuck on the platform. Once we're locked in, the path to infinity has been blocked. Instead, we're caught in a Truman Show-like repetition of the now, toiling around 
in the micro mess of online others that try to do their best, masking their failures and despair like everyone else. In the social media era, the Oblomov position is no longer a possibility. In particular, for those that cannot economically afford to get stuck within the abyss. We experience the sadness of online existentialism minus the absurdity. If only interpassivity was really implemented in code instead of being yet another idea, we would indulge in a permanent state of indolent apathy. Instead, there is nothing passive about actions. Being on social, the Zen status of detachment is an ontological impossibility. We're never really lurking. Our presence is always noted. And we can therefore never truly enjoy the secretive voyeur status. Interaction is our tragic existence. Instead, we're constantly asked to upgrade, fill in forms and rank our taxi drivers. Google and Facebook know how to utilize negative emotions more readily to the new system-wide goal. Find personal ways to make you feel bad. There's no single way to make everyone happy. Compared to others, your ranking is low. And this makes you sad. Even technological sadness is a style, a bite a cold one. The sorrow, no matter how, is real. This is what happens when we can no longer distinguish between telephone and society. If we can't freely change our profile and feel too weak to delete the app, we're condemned to feverishly check for updates during the in-between moments of our busy lives. In a split second, the real-time machine has teleported us out of our current situation and onto another playing field filled with mini reports we quickly have to investigate. Omnipresent social media places a claim on our elapsed time our fractured lives. We're all sad in our very own way. As there are no lulls or quiet moments anymore, the result is fatigue, depletion and loss of energy. We're becoming obsessed with waiting. Have you been forgotten by your loved ones. Time, meticulously measured on every app, tells us right in our face. Two days, 11 hours, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Kronos hurts. Should I post something to attract attention? and show that I'm still here? Nobody likes me anymore. As the random messages keep relentlessly piling in, there's no way to hold them. Take a moment and think it all through. Delacroix once noted that every day which is not noted is like a day that does not exist. 
diary writing used to fulfill that task. Elements of early blog world culture try to update the diary form for the online realm. But that moment has now passed. Unlike the blog entries of the Web 2.0 era, social media have surpassed the summary stage of the diary in a desperate attempt to keep up with the real-time regime. Instagram stories, for example, bring back the nostalgia of an unfolding chain of events and then disappear at the end of the day. Like a revenge act, a satire of ancient sentiments gone by. Storage will make the pain permanent. Better forget about it and move on. Okay, I'll stop here and I would like to now um, invite Nadine back to discuss um, yeah, a, a few other elements because um, yeah, this is um, as I said, it's a, what is it? An, uh, it's not a rainbow. It's a, it's a landscape. It's a, uh, a whole specter of emotions and feelings. And I've yeah, picked out here only, only one. Thank you, Geert, for uh, your uh, presentation. And before we dive into the um, yeah, this mapping that we talked about, um, and I'll tell a bit more about that in a bit. But can I ask you, when did you experience um, technological sadness for the last time yourself? Oh, that's certainly on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really had to think I was, I was stuck in this... Uh, Convinced that well, I have to co convince Google that I'm not a robot, and it took me like five five uh, turns, and that really made me not only sad but kind of angry too. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, this idea of of waiting. I, I think yeah, today I was waiting for several things, and you know, in fact, we can't wait anymore because in in the real time regime. And uh, I agree, you know, my, my, my work is very, very much uh, based on uh, a very specific notion of time. Uh, so a lot of what I write is derived from this uh, notion that, you know, I take from people like Paul Virilio, the philosopher of speed, about uh, the, the, in, the intense... Um, yeah, he could even calls it dictatorship uh, of having to having to live in the real time regime, in which uh, you know it becomes, for instance, impossible to wait for others. Why would you wait for others? You know, when they are there, where well, you are there, right? So you're always there, Nadine, <laughs> and, and this is the problem, right? Huh? So um, yeah. if I have to wait for you, knowing that you are there, right? Uh, yeah. This is really, this is difficult. Mm? And this yeah. is kind of uh, yeah. what, what defines now, uh, you know, the, the social uh, exchange uh, between people, between lovers, in families, um, even in business, I would say. Mm? Yeah. And also, I, I have to maybe um, add to this that waiting on the one hand, but on the other side, if you want to if you're letting someone wait, that's that's another uh, that's the other side of the spectrum, right? So when sometimes you feel like, oh no, I don't don't want to be involved in this WhatsApp conversation now, or a friend calls who has you want to answer immediately, but you feel like, oh no, I don't have the time for this, and then you also suffer from this um, letting someone else wait. So we're always yeah. um, trapped. Yeah, and, and that's of course the um, um, the fact that we're by definition doing a lot of things uh, simultaneously. The one you know is maybe better 
in multitasking than the others. But, um, you know, all organizations uh, require this uh, from us that we, um, that we do permanent uh, multitasking. Imagine, you know, yeah. come up somewhere and, so and you could defend to say, no, I have to finish first this and then that and then that, right? Well, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's completely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And so um, you really wanted um, to get a, you say that it's very important to get a better understanding of all those states of uh, feelings that are related to the sadness or like, um, yeah, yeah, in, this, in a different so. layer of the sadness and because on, we, on the top, on the top yeah, layer we have much. the ups. So the, um, when we are really like on track, we're like, um, the upper, so um, the dopamine highs, um, which are followed by heart crashes, as you describe them, you know, the euphoric high is, is followed by the inevitable crash. And then we have long periods of numbness, of waiting, of the sadness. And um, why do you think it's so important to get a better understanding of this uh, mid layer, so to say? Well, first of all, because literally billions of people are exposed to it, right? We, we can't just say, okay, um, you know, 1% of the population is depressed. Um, we feel sorry for them. Uh, we hope that there is some medication and therapy. Uh, that's it, right? No, um, it's not like that. Um, I don't know if people have seen uh, VPRO Tegenlicht, uh, the, mo the most recent one. Uh, on loneliness, uh, that uh, TV documentary uh, starts with, uh, you know, a very um, normal uh, statistic uh, statement uh, that 40% uh, uh, of the Dutch population, uh, you know, suffers uh, from uh, loneliness. Um, and, and this is a, this is a really, um, uh, you know, important uh, sociological uh, fact, shocking, of course. Um, you know, um, even there, uh, what I find interesting about it, um, this is not uh, a disease, you know, you, you can't go to a doctor to be cured from, uh, from loneliness. Uh, same with sadness. Um, of course, this is the case with uh, burnout, with depression, and there are a lot of others, um, you know, that are, uh, have become medical, right? Uh, in my essay, I discuss uh, the melancholia, which in the past, uh, you know, was considered um, a, uh, a disease. Um, and people were withdrawing and, um, you know, were contemplating. Um, these days, of course, uh, that's no longer uh, possible uh, in our mass uh, society, consumer society. Um, it's impossible to uh, be uh, melancholic. Uh, you know, only the very rich maybe can can afford uh, that. Um, today, uh, as Sherry Turkle says, you know, we are alone uh, together. Uh, uh, so our loneliness, in a, in a strange way, uh, is is um, accelerated and defined by the permanent presence of online others. Right? And this is this is very strange because uh, also in the in the documentary we um, we get to know a few um, students and they're they're online all the time, yet they have very very clear um, you know symptoms of, of loneliness. Yeah, I don't know if you know the the whole medica medicalization is, it becomes a little bit uh, difficult, right? And this is also something that I find really, really interesting. Also, the whole uh, kind of analytic and sociological fact that only five percent, you know, of the population um, falls victim to, uh, let's say, fake news. Only five percent. Yeah, what does that mean, right? The whole idea uh, of the anomaly uh, that you are uh, the exception, um, you know. Yeah, what does that mean? You know, there are so many exceptions and we we often have the feeling that um, not only we feel for the others who are suffering from it, 
but we can in almost instantly uh you know recognize ourselves uh in 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 this um and yeah and some of it is maybe uh, you know gender related i don't know if you look into that in your work you know some people yeah. say and they come to me and say yeah the sadness this whole inner world that's that's a bit female and um, you know the the shit storms and uh, the anger the the real um you know anti-vaxxers the people who believe in conspiracy theory that they tend to be male yeah i don't know yeah maybe i would say like you know, i would make the distinction like you have the feminine and the masculine energy that you would put out there i mean i i'm also super as you know interested by people like uh, Melissa Broder or Amelia Uman, artists and creatives who share their emotions um, online. Also, as you, and most of them are part of my generation because I think this, this is also has to do with a generational difference um, and which you also in your book mention. And I always think that I was, <laughs> I could have been the one who said this, like millennials, um, that they have grown up with talking more openly about their state of mind and, um, and a, a, a difficulty in uh, distinguishing work life. And so I really recognize myself in this, that I always super easily share what I feel or what I think. And I, and I think that's also being reflected on the sad side now, like your, your sad feelings, um, because in the beginning, when the social media, the bigger platforms were there, we were only sharing our, uh, you know, the highs. And um, I think that the lows sharing our sadness has become also uh, a new business model for likes, you know, a new way to get the attention, to share your true, honest, deepest feelings on the internet, to be... Um, to look more real whatever that may be um so i also see that on more on the feminine side and then on the this and the masculine energy you have the shouting and the trolling and more aggressive uh ways of communicating i think but i don't think it's that yeah i i, I don't think it's completely related to um uh, gender um so are there any other, uh, because in your book, you also say that the neighboring feelings eh, of the sadness, so uh, wordlessness, blankness, joylessness, the fear of accelerating boredom, um, the feeling of nothingness. Um, what, what, how, how can we, how should we think about these uh, differences or um, different feelings? How should we deal with them? Well, first of all, I think it's very good to uh, explore them and really widely discuss them. We see that now happening very recently, uh, being the case with loneliness. And I think a lot of people appreciate that, right? In two, three, five years ago, we rarely heard anything about it. Um, the, the feeling, for instance, of uh, nothingness. I can remember the first time, you know, I spoke about uh, uh, online uh, nihilism. Uh, people were enraged. This was really, really not, I was really fiercely attacked, huh? especially, of course, by the kind of managerial new age class that, uh, you know, is always on the positive side. Huh? And, uh, Can you explain maybe a little bit more, Geert, about this uh, online uh, nihilism? What you mean for the people that don't? Yeah. Uh... Well, it, it, it's just, it's not uh, it's got nothing to do with uh, let's say the Russian uh, 19th century version or uh, or even uh, the, the one uh, you know Nietzsche speaks uh, about. Um, it really means that you tend to zero. Uh, in a world that is defined by uh, one and zeros, um, it means that uh, you go kind of to a position which is uh, extremely flat, hmm? uh, in which, uh, you know, um, maybe also what Baudrillard writes about uh, the silent uh, majority. But then this is a silence that is uh, almost, uh, you know, indulgent because people really... Um, uh, feel like 
you know, they ha they can retreat in that in that position. And it's not because uh, they they want to throw bombs or uh, you know because they want to blow up the world. The nihilism is much much yeah the, I would say a much more uh, civilized form <laughs> of nihilism. Uh, much more. Uh, may, maybe we can even talk about uh, you know um, a, a so, sort of a dem democratic nihilism, hmm? right? Uh, and, and with that, I mean that uh, this is uh, widely spread and accessible to uh, uh, in, uh, a lot of different uh, groups in society, in uh, in social classes. Mm -hmm. While, while mm -hmm. in the past, nihilism, you know, was was seen as something very, very extreme, um, and uh, you know, very, very much attached to a very specific political specter. Um, and um, uh, it was bordering almost to, let's say, um, you know, murder or um, genocide, uh, uh, mass murder, that this kind of thing. Hmm? But that's no mm -hmm. longer the case. And so um, this project and all the people that I've been talking to, um, also outside of this project and also my own, from my own observations, you know what? And what you also talk about in uh, in your book is, and uh, which worries me a lot, is you know when even we are aware, you know where where um, you know I study the internet and digital culture already for like ten years, and I I'm aware of the of the powers and the mechanisms and how it influences my brain, and still I'm constantly distracted, constantly. You know, I find it also hard to leave Facebook, and I know I'm still using WhatsApp. I have. You know, I'm also, even while being aware, and now I feel like I'm confessioning that I'm still this this hypocrite, you know. No, uh, no, but no. I think it, it illustrates how hard it is, if you even you are aware, to get, um, you know, to deal with it in a certain way. So what no. do you think about this? Like how, how, well, it, it how, says what something do I have to also do with this? About, yeah, but it says something about, uh, you know, 30, 40 years of, uh, immense uh, investments in um, you know so-called user-friendly uh, design um, and um, um, this this is our social life we are social animals and if that's made very very easy um, uh, you know we cannot uh, simply suppress and uh, stop our um, our curiosity um, so um, and there are also very good, uh, you know, neuroscientific uh, uh, studies. Uh, I don't uh, use them so much, but, um, you know, I, I strongly believe in them. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, so, but, um, you know, the, their studies on uh, the massive uh, use of social media, I, I find uh, <coughs> extremely compelling. Um, and um you know but we we should not uh, feel like uh you know we are sick right um as you know um uh, i made an album uh, of all this material it's uh, with a group uh, with john longwalker and we it's called we are not sick yeah? and that's the mm -hmm. name of the band yeah? uh, and it's also the name of the website like right? we are not sick.com and there you can find seven songs that we made all based on you know the conversation you and I are having here. However, yeah. why is it we are not sick, right? But this is a very very important uh, statement because Nadine, you are not sick, right? This is the hmm. complete different. Uh, the, the would be the wrong uh, approach to say because one of the, one of the uh, big problems there is that it kind of preassumes some kind of uh, superiority. Of, of a normal position in which uh, you know people uh, <coughs> who are who are not sick can judge the others. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, yeah, uh, exactly. You know, yeah. And, and so I think that I think that's also a bit of a problem with the um, sometimes the mainstream um, uh, critique. Is, for instance, with the social dilemma that you really have this one person person who is dramatically being um 
um, shown as one of the persons that's the one that's having an issue, you know, whether mental or uh, whatever, um, that is ill or sick because she cannot deal with the um, with the phone or the smart the internet in a what is believed a healthy way. Yeah, so I, I don't want to go there. Uh, on the other hand, we also know that if it gets really bad, and usually then there are a uh, multiplicity of factors, we can yeah. get sick, right? And that's also important to notice, right? The vast majority of us, none of us is sick. However, huh, we can get seriously depressed. We can get a very, very serious burnout. And, uh, you know, for that, you really need uh, to see uh, a doctor uh, get in, in therapy, maybe even get uh, medication uh, or, um, you know, try try something drastic uh, to go out. So that distinction we need to uh, maintain, I find that very, very important. Um, yeah, and so you also say that, you, um, that we need ways to uh, politicize the situation and that we need to get rid of the addiction um, metaphor. So how yeah. can we collectively, how can we enforce this change? Okay, well, for me, it's very simple. Um, if we can get rid of, uh, of platforms where everybody uh, has to uh, gather and we kind of um, reinvent the idea of social networks in, we, in which you know, we are in contact with each other because that's very human. It's all too human, right? So the idea that we have to punish ourselves by not being able uh, to communicate with the, the dear ones, uh, you know, amongst us, if they are far away or very nearby, it doesn't really matter. That is uh, nonsense, right? What we need to do is we need to um, turn those um, social needs that we have uh, also the need to organize, uh, to organize our lives. Uh, to, to, yeah, we, that's normal and we can use all these technologies for that. What, what we need is we you have to go from the platform back to the tool, right? In which uh, these uh, apps again become quite focused uh, tools for something that we want to achieve, right? And Google, Facebook, and all the rest, they do not want to offer us tools. No way, right? Because if once we're starting to use the tools, uh, they will, of course, not uh, include uh, advertisement. Uh, all the algorithms, etc., have no uh, access um, to, these, uh, to these tools, right? It is only on the platform that uh, all these um, kind of invisible dynamics uh, really can unfold and can be used uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a maximum uh, way. So if we go back uh, to the tool, uh, we can still do qu quite a bit, a fair bit of what we're doing uh, right now, um, but pr very likely without all the negative impact. Okay, and um, so we also have some questions for the audi uh, for, from the audience. Um, one of them is, in, um, is one personality type more vulnerable for this digital fatigue or loneliness and sadness than the other? Um, and if so, which personality type is more vulnerable? And um, it says not thinking in terms as uh, male or female, uh, but... Um, yeah, more from a person personality type of uh, perspective. Yeah, I'm not a psychologist, so I I I never um, uh, wrote about um, you know the um, the different um, characteristics uh, or characters uh, that uh, that we have. Um, yeah, I don't uh, buy into this uh, theory. Um, I, I don't think that this is uh, this is a useful framework, but I'm curious what well, you I would think say. I would mm -hmm. say, like, also Gerald Moore will join afterwards. He really um, it gave me some new perspectives, 
And um, you also relate to that in your book, Geert, when you say that, you know, well, leaving Facebook is like leaving um, a, a bad ro romantic relationship when you know that it's not good for you, but you cannot leave, which also I believe mm. has to do with uh, how your your own self-worth or your personality mm. um, type traits or, you know, how you, your uh, way of your ideas about the world, your values, and um, how you are, your attachment style. And he also made a link between attachment styles and um, addiction. And I think that certain types of person are a bit more impulsive. So they, um, you know, or people with, um, yeah. I don't want to say this, That's attention true, disorders. But we also know, we know from the, you know, the, 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 the corporate strategies that uh, uh, also Google, Facebook, and the rest, they know that there are different types of people, right? And they mm -hmm. cater for these different types. So it, yeah. it's not like oh, Google and Facebook are only looking uh, you know, for sad people. No, um, as you know, they're, they're, they're very, very um, interested uh, in anger, in frustration, in um, aggression, uh, yeah. So um, you know, but so that's why I I am now really in favor of uh, of this idea of the emotional specter, um, and it is up to us, uh, artists, researchers, really to uh, understand. Um, you know, and pick out maybe one specific uh, aspect of it and then really dive into it. Uh, because there's a lot of work that, uh, that can be done uh, uh, and uh, st still has not really been done. As you know, uh, the, the political class, especially in, uh, in the Western countries in the last years, uh, they have been uh, very much focused on uh, the so-called fake news uh, you know, uh, and and now nowadays it has even shifted a little bit away from fake news to uh, conspiracy theories, hmm? and the whole mm -hmm. anti-vaccine and, uh, and so on uh, is a is a part of of that, and th that is now uh, the core uh, you know political problem of uh, of the ruling uh, of the ruling class. Unfortunately, it's not uh, the sadness. Yeah. So we should politicize uh, sadness. Well, yeah, I mean, they they obviously feel very, very, uh, you know, uh, existentially threatened by by these uh, theories that uh, up to uh, you know a couple of years ago uh, were completely invisible, unknown, uh, marginal. Uh, you know, you couldn't even study it uh, properly. You know, it was so um, futile. And look now, yeah. now it's it's the core. And I see one final question before we move on um, that just comes in. Um, do you think that the users' feeling uh, feelings or attachment towards social media might change post Corona? Are we getting bored? Oh, definitely, absolutely, and um, uh, it's. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, you know this um, this key term um, was used here. Um, boredom. Boredom, of course. Yeah, um, and uh, boredom. Yeah, it's as we know, we're quite ambivalent about it. Um, we have to also be a little bit. Uh, careful because there's a whole kind of almost Christian kind of therapeutic idea that uh, boredom is good and that it will bring up uh, you know quite, quite a lot of uh, creativity because right so yeah I don't want to I would I don't want to go there um, um, and uh, yeah, let, let's let's focus on it. But definitely, um, I believe, uh, maybe I hope that uh, you know the post-COVID uh, period is going to be a very, very different one for sure. Because people are so fed up, so tired, so bored of this situation, and um, 
it, it's quite, quite predictable that uh, some or multiple forms uh, of explosion, you know, will, will happen. Yeah, partying yeah. will be one, but uh, there, there will be many, many others, maybe even very questionable forms of uh, explosion uh, ahead of us. Yeah, I also believe that there's going to be still going to be some a uh, lots of sadness too, actually, and um, you know, or this morning someone told me that well, he was scared. Of... Be, right, the damage of this uh, this period, uh, the psychological damage, is so huge. So uh, yeah, needs time uh, to uh, repair. We, we, once the psychological damage is done. Uh, you know, it's not enough to uh, be liberated and uh, feel happy ever after. Um, it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah. We know that uh, also from from the period uh, after World War Two, of course. Hmm? Yeah, so and be um, before okay, just one final question because I see it coming in, so I'm 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 I'm, I'm taking the time. Um, because I think it's slightly it's related, but um, it, and it's important. Um, so, what do you think of Trump's Twitter account being banned, and in how far should these platforms or politics interfere with the published content? Yeah, um, censorship, um, uh, filtering, um, um, the moderation. Um, you know, all these things uh, have happened. Uh, from day one in the in the on the social media platforms, right? Uh, so the the banning of Trump is uh, is uh, one of the more recent and maybe the most uh, visible uh, and most uh, discussed one. But um, you know this happens to many many thousands of people on a daily basis, right? So uh, people are being kicked out of these centralized platforms all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is done for commercial reasons, uh, for political reasons, uh, just because an algorithm said so. Um, you know, think of, uh, you know, th this dreadful film uh, that uh, was made, a documentary about uh, the people who have to do uh, the, the, mo the moderation. Um, yeah, the cleaners. You mean the cleaners uh, with that office yeah. in uh, in Manila, which uh, you know it was really, yeah. And then uh, also in a in a in a class when I was teaching in an art academy, I uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to meet one of the cleaners. Uh, so one of the art students there um, did that as a job on the side, uh, and uh, was able uh, in class. To give a first-hand uh, account, uh, you know how this works, and so I I want to put uh, you know in in that uh, perspective, and I want to say that uh, again that this is the product of uh, you know centralized platforms. This is what uh, we brought on to ourselves. Uh, if you eliminate the multiplicity of uh, of networks and go for the one platform. This is what you have to deal with. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Geert. Okay, we have to uh, move on. Uh, we see you back later in the, um, with the other questions. And um, again, if you have any uh, questions left for Geert or um, for uh, uh, other speakers coming up, um, to save them for the... Um, yeah, you can you can share them in the chat, but you can also uh, save them for later while we are having drinks in the Zoom bar. Um, so um, no breaks this evening, as I said earlier, but it's time to um, grab your headphones and get ready to relax uh, for a bit, because um, artist Anika Kapner uh, will guide us through a brief meditation exploring our inner images and the somatic dimension of our relationship with the online world. Um, here's Anika. Hi, thanks Nadine and um, yeah, hello everybody. I will give you a super brief introduction to what we're going to be doing. So as Nadine said, we're going to go through a guided meditation to explore alternative dimensions of our relationship with the web. 
Um, so rather than using the linear thought processes that we are uh, engaging with to find solutions or uh, let's say perspectives on the situation we are in, in the, our co-creative process with uh, the web as a tool, um, it's the, this uh, meditation will seek to open up a more felt experience um, so that you can relate differently, which is not necessarily positive or negative, you know, the emotions you might feel. So it does not relate directly to mindfulness that uses similar techniques to actually make us more apt in performing in the contemporary machinery. It's rather a tool to question actually um, the way we relate. Yeah. So without further ado, I uh, would like to invite you to make yourself comfortable. So to sit as relaxed as possible, or if even uh, if that's also available to you, you can even lay down. Um, I'm gonna guide you for roughly 10 to 15 minutes. If at any point in time you feel uncomfortable, um, you can simply focus on your breathing and open your eyes. Um, otherwise, just enjoy. And um, so please start with closing your eyes. And then you start focusing on your breath. And you simply observe the breath. As you inhale, and you exhale. And again, you inhale, and you exhale. Fill your lungs, your chest, your belly with the air, streaming into your nostrils. Feel how the breath oxygenates your blood. And with each exhale, release tension. Thoughts and worries. Allow the air to entirely fill up your body, your lungs, your chest, your belly, reaching into your fingertips, your toes your back, your face, your head, and again exhale fully, release all tension, all questions. If you're having a hard time observing your breath or following, then just allow that to be there. Just allow your body, your mind, your emotions to be in that space. Regardless of what you're seeing, hearing from your mind, Allow yourself to be present. With your next inhale, 
follow the oxygen as it moves through your entire system, as it oxygenates your blood, and with the blood, transports information, nutrients through your entire body through the network of your art, through your entire organism. How it feeds your lungs, your brain, your skin, your organs, your digestive system. your nervous system, your bones, your reproductive system, your brain, and with that, your emotions, your thoughts, your actions. Again, follow with your inner eye and with your attention how the air that you inhale transforms and is integrated into your entire body, running through your veins, with your blood, and with each exhale, releasing all information that has been used and is not necessary. Feel how with each inhale, the energy of the air in your heart is creating transformation in yourself, in your entire system. how information signals are transmitted into your system. And how your own system again generates signals and connections with the outer world. Now, see by in and exhaling. Now allow yourself to visualize from your body how the signals you make, the actions you perform. the organisms, the objects you interact with that you co-create. How they create a network like fine lines emanating from the different parts of the body, from your fingertips, from your eyes, your ears, your brain, your heart, your stomach, your reproductive cord, your feet, how filaments extend into the space around you, and how in that space around you, Images of the web, the internet, the digital technologies we interact with, emerge. Observe what you see.
objects, conversations, data, transactions, emotional transactions, physical transactions, economic, social, political transactions. Observe from your inner element the connection of your body with these filaments with the filaments of the web. Observe how you coping the web with your thoughts that materialize into action, emotions, objects, transactions, the web and in the material world. Seen in front of you, like a vast corridor, the intertwining of these filaments of interaction. And allow whatever wants to be seen to emerge in front of your inner heart. For the web has many, almost infinite dimensions, like the mind, and the scale and scope of the capacity to cope What do you see? Observe what you see. Observe how it makes you feel, how it connects to you. What do you want to see? What do you want to converse with that what you see? To understand. a different way. Ask. If it has to tell you anything. The web. Your inner and outer web of interaction. Whatever you see, allow yourself to observe. Don't judge. Witness this image. The feeling it creates in your body. The way your body resonates with it. The emotion, the thoughts, and visions that occur. Now gently release the images of the web. 
back into this vast space that is your entire that is your interior world Observe the filaments around your body. How they retreat. Still remaining active. Yet becoming less visible to your inner eye as you slowly come back into your body, into the space, feeling the surface you're sitting or laying upon, feeling your skin, feeling the clothes that touch your skin, feeling the air that touches your skin, Inhaling deeply, filling up your chest, your belly, releasing any tension, any anxiety that is not needed. Inhaling deeply one more time. And then slowly start to move your fingertips and your toe tips. Wiggle them. Stretch yourself. Allow your body to integrate what it has experienced. And then ever so slowly in your own time, open your eyes. Take a couple of more deep breaths. Then thank you for sharing your inner space. And um, I will pass the floor back to Nadine. Thank you. Thank you, Annika. I'm Shukesh now. Um, and I hope you are too. If you have questions for Annika, you can save them uh, for later. She will be uh, with us in the Zoom bar. Um, I hope you're still awake and I hope you got some more insight on uh, how you relate to um, internet and social media. And so um, before moving on to the live interview, Um, part of the web uh, are two uh, by uh, Anxious to Make, who are not here tonight, unfortunately. Um, but you can find the survey on the website. And the other one um, is by me, in which you are asked uh, the same questions as I asked the contributors to the uh, web project. So um, let me see. The slides should be there. So these are just the first uh, results. And um, the slides. Okay, I don't see them yet. So maybe someone can at the next slide. Um, at least I will share the first result. So it turns out that the most respondents, um, they think that uh, the increase in burnouts is related to how people uh, live uh, their lives online. And now, ah, here's the first slide, as you can see. And um, no one of the respondents finds digital technologies uh, not stressful. Most of them find them stressful or are neutral. A lot of people are uh, often distracted by uh, the internet, as this diagram shows. And when they are, uh, for instance, by YouTube, uh, they might feel guilty at some point. 
um, because we asked them, imagine you are on YouTube and you realize it's 4 a.m. What do you feel? Um, let me see. Um, also, most people consider themselves addicted to uh, the internet. Well, most only use their smartphones for only four to six hours a day. I mean, it's not too bad, right? And uh, the respondents are not really into meditation, as this diagram shows. So I hope you uh, all survived Annika's prey. Um, but they do go offline or leave their smartphones at home from time to time to relax and stay focused. And lots of people think digital detox is a business model, um, which I think is a good thing that they uh, are aware of this. And um, I was very happy to hear that most people don't think about emails when they were having sex, except for when it's bad sex, which I think is a good thing. Um, we also asked them about their biggest concerns uh, about the internet. And now, next slide, please. And um, there are quite there were quite a big uh, quite, quite a lot of uh, concerns shared, such as uh, the focus on the short short term, um, the instantaneousness uh, instead of the longer term, the loss of time, the loss of privacy, misinformation, misinformation, feeling uh, of feeling the polarity, the lack of own thoughts or opinions, um, that we stop talking to people outside of our own bubbles. Um, hate, nasty algorithms, shallowness, uh, all things that were uh, shared as their biggest concerns. And also income, uh, social inequality becoming greater due to the digital divide, uh, feelings of being lost, don't know what to do with the internet, um, distraction from real life, lots of things to think about. Next slide, please. And we also um, asked people uh, what they were hoping that the internet of the future would be like. And some struggle to envision a better future. Um, some never thought about it. Uh, someone thinks it will become obsolete. Others think it will become invisible because it will be more uh, integrated. And I really liked um, this quote by the guy or girl who's trying to uh, download all the books, I think. Yeah, it's kind of... Um, yeah, I can relate to that. It also made me think of me downloading all the music possible in the early days of the internet on Netscape because I was so afraid that I was never going to be able to download free music again. So uh, that didn't happen, uh, luckily. Um, but they also um, hoping that the internet of the future is uh, more open, decentralized, flexible, less powerful, democratic, um, cooperative, uh, social, um, that it privacy, that it's privacy protected, quiet, cozy, peaceful, mindful, that it has no advertisements, uh, that it is for the greater good instead of for uh, the purpose of business model and shareholders. And it focuses more as a tool to achieve something in the real world, which is also what Geert just pointed out. And then uh, one of the final questions, how do you feel when you get a like? And some people feel happy, flattered, slightly excited or appreciated. Um, but also a lot of people don't get likes anymore. Um, they are not posting anything anymore or, are or it just rarely happens. Um, some worry and it seems like people care less about likes, maybe because as someone mentions, hearts are better. And um, just to give you an overview of who answered all these questions, their most respondents were uh, what we call millennials like me. And um, we really want to have more uh, responses. So uh, I hope this brief sharing of the first results uh, triggered you to fill out the questionnaire. You can find it on the research section of um, the Disrupt and Reflect website. Um, so, okay, that was that. Um, now we go on to the live interview roulette. Um, so before we start, I'd like to introduce you to everyone. Um, so we have uh, Geert Lovink, Dasha Elina, uh, digital artist based in Paris. Um, we have uh, Catriona Beals, 
um, artist based in London, Roos Groothuizen, media artist uh, from the Netherlands. And uh, we have uh, Sofia Stankovic from Tiyash, a digital design duo who made uh, the web design for the project. Vanessa Bartlett, a researcher and curator all the way from Melbourne. Um, Annika Kapner and Gerald Moore, a professor in digital studies at Durham University in the UK. Hi, everyone. <laughs> It's good to see you. So what we're going to do, um, we have an animated oracle uh, that will ask a question. And when the question is asked, we transfer one of the contributors to the uh, answering booth and they will share their um, thoughts and ideas. Um, this technology doesn't allow for immediate interaction. So we cannot ask them um, questions or we can. Um, you can put them in the chat and maybe they will answer them la later because I noticed that some of them are uh, also reading the chat and uh, you can also save them for later so we can ask them directly in the Zoom bar. So the first question uh, goes to Katriona. If we are aware of the risks of giving away our data and secrets, why can't we resist? Okay, so, um, well, in my research, I've thought a lot about the way that platforms are designed to be addictive and they utilize certain behavioral psychological techniques to keep users on device. So, um, a lot of those responses are kind of evolutionary developed so it's sort of hardwired that we might respond in certain ways to things like variable reward and um notifications and things like that so i think it's important to have a critical awareness of it and i i hope that that is increasing that sense that we are being channeled and our behavior is being manipulated but i um I don't think that necessarily means that we are then immune. Certainly not in my case. Certainly also not in my case. Thank you. Uh, so we go on to the uh, next question. And that question is for Tiaj. Sophia. What means being offline for you? Where and when can you truly be offline? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I think it's an easy one, probably in, in the nature. So usually when I'm uh, by the bee, by the yeah, seaside and, and uh, enjoying sun, uh, stuff like that then i really don't need my phone and it even feels a bit uh, artificial in that environment um because it's yeah truly amazing what you can see uh, around you when you are in nature um i also manage to be on offline uh, at home of course but usually this these are shorter periods and i either need to really organize them and, and schedule time offline or i'd be offline for half an hour probably. Thank you. I also really like to spend lots of time in the, the forest um, or outside on the beach. Um, so next question is for Gerald. How do you manage to focus yourself? Uh Simple answer. I don't think I do. Um, there's plenty of data out there that, that says that every time one looks away from the internet, uh, it takes about half an hour to refocus. And we tend to, to, to look away at our phones or the internet somewhere between uh, 60 and 220 times a day, depending on how you count. Um, I, I'd be fairly certain that um, uh, if you actually recorded the amount of time that I'm 
working or writing productively, uh, it probably wouldn't amount to, to very much at all uh, at the moment, um, probably going back a few years now. Uh, but the marginally more serious answer is that I think that so much of this comes down to relative stimulus. One of the things that we know about addiction is that it doesn't work in the way of, of hijacking the brain, taking hold of the cognitive apparatus in quite the way that was uh, claimed during the uh, war against drugs and in its height in the, the 80s and 90s. Um, addiction, to my mind at least, is, is much more a question of relative uh, stimulus, the fact that it's uh, more appealing to its alternatives. Um, so uh, occasionally, intermittently, I will get uh, more appealing alternatives to, to mucking around and, and checking my email, and they're the things that enable me to focus. But for the most part, I don't think I really do get them uh, very much. You know, short bursts of writing when I find myself uh, engrossed at childcare, when uh, I think it would reflect very badly on me if I, I didn't focus on it a bit more. Um, I think one, one thing that's become uh, surprisingly uh, useful is that my work introduced two-factor authentication uh, about a month ago. And it's such a faff. Uh, to, you know, I used to leave my mobile phone in the kitchen while I was working so that I wouldn't be checking it constantly. Um, now, the fact that I need to carry it everywhere with me to, to check my email means that I've stopped checking my email as much as I, I could do. So we end up with, with something like two-factor authentication becoming uh, surprisingly uh, useful as a, a ta tactic for uh, switching off. Thank you, Gerald. I really love, I've, I'm also very bad at focusing. Um, and I picked my phone up only 80 times today. So it's, I guess those people, um, doing that way, way more often. Um, so the next question goes to um, Geert. If you could reset the internet, to which time machine backup would you set it to? Yeah, it's very, very tempting, of course. Um, if you know anything about my biography, um, it would obviously be, what shall we say, I don't know, 95 or 96, uh, both uh, appealing years, but uh, I would say 95, definitely, um, is the year in which uh, a lot of stuff was uh, introduced, of course, uh, also for my own biography important that um, it was the the year when we launched uh, net time uh, me uh, together with pitt and uh, of course then many others and um yeah it's it's not uh, i'm not nostalgic for um the fact that there were no social media i i found the internet back then uh, quite uh, quite fast and efficient of course at the time the world wide web that was uh, introduced back then was uh, still called www wait 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 and um, yeah there was a reason for that mm, you know it, people were dialing up through telephones and um, uh, yeah it, but we never had the idea that it uh, somehow slow. It felt like, uh, you know, the perfect uh, acceleration machine. And that's also uh, how it turned, uh, turned out uh, to be. Uh, so if we would go back to 95, um, you know, you would, uh, you would be able to enjoy um, what you see is what you get, right? The, the, the most primitive, uh, earliest uh, version of what we're doing here with uh, live uh, video. So even at that time, there was a uh, live uh, video and it, it was uh, exciting. Oh, 
Okay, and uh, thank you, Geert. Um, yeah, I was super young then, <laughs> but I was happy that I at least um, got to see where uh, it started. Um, you know, being uh, the same age almost as a um, as a internet as we know it from those days. Um, so um, the next question is to Gerald again. What are you hoping the internet of the future will be like? That's a, a, a good question. I think every time, I mean, I can answer it two ways. I, I can answer it in the kind of uh, typical consumer way, which is what secretly I'd really like the internet to be. And I can answer it in the philosopher theoretical way of what I think it should be like if we're all to avoid uh, rotting into withered little stumps. Um, what I'd really like it to be is I'd like to see something like uh, Google replaced uh, or, 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 or Google Earth replaced by a, a, a four-dimensional uh, capacity to scroll backwards and forwards through time so we could zoom into Google Earth and then uh, choose the particular moment in history where we'd uh, like to scroll into, and then we could find all the. If we, you know, if we're looking for uh, his, researching history or literature, we could see uh, a new kind of search engine where all these uh, particular resources would be uh, historically located. For example, so a a three D reconstruction or a four D reconstruction of what medieval Paris looked like. Um, hidden within a, 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 a four-dimensional uh, bar on, on Google Earth. I think that's where I'd like to see search endings heading. Uh, I think that'd be a fantastic educational resource. Um, but equally, it would be one that entirely is in keeping with the current model of Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook and the like, because they're the only people with the uh, financial resources to, to pull off that kind of scale of, of improvement. Um, I think... Speaking more philosophically uh, or, or practically, the, the kind of thing that I'd like to see is uh, much more localization in the way that the internet works. So imagine that GeoCities had just gone the way of being a boring, defunct blog, and it had become uh, a, a real way of uh, creating vital communities at, at a local level. I think one of the, and actually this was alluded to earlier on one of the slides with the disappearance of the internet, um, you think not just about uh, the devastating effect that the internet has had on localities at the level of uh, destroying high streets and, and, and that kind of thing, but think about it at the level of power infrastructures too. Nowadays, pretty much every technology uh, that we have runs through the internet. Um, I think there's increasing attention being paid to what happens in the event that this plan A fails, either because you get solar flares uh, brought on by uh, in relation to climate change or because you get uh, Russian submarines cutting the internet wires under the ocean or because you've got an overstressed power grid that just collapses. Um, I think we could do with much more localization at the level of the, the power grid so that we've got, I think, the old stat the last time I checked it was that the internet has seven or six or seven physical manifestations in huge server banks around the world, one of which is in Maryland and one of which is in Brazil. And I think there are seven online virtual manifestations of the internet cloud. Cloud storage cloud will know this better than I do. But this kind of overburdening of the technological infrastructure doesn't bode well in the event that uh, uh, servers start going down. I'd like to see much more deterritorialization uh, at the level of internet structures and where that uh, localization of web resources goes hand in hand with uh, a greater focus on, on uh, the internet as a, a local resource uh, for building up uh, vitality, community projects, that kind of thing. So uh, an undoing of the, the vitiation of, uh, of, of urban lifestyles by the, 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 Amazon, uh, the Amazonification of the high street. 
Thank you, Gerald, for your answer. And so we go quickly to the next question. Um, and that it, one is for Dasha. I think the question is coming. Yeah. What is the longest break you have ever taken from the internet? What kinds of benefits did you experience? Oh God. Um, I want to say something like an hour. Well, no, I guess I sleep for about eight to nine hours. So that would probably be the longest break I've ever taken from the internet. Um, the benefits, of course, are you get to sleep. <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, I don't know. I don't tend to take breaks very often from the internet, unfortunately. Um, I think I'm way past the stage of being incredibly addicted to it, where, um, I don't know, it's, it's really hard to perform even the most basic tasks, like going to places that you've gone to a million times and you definitely know how to get there, but you still feel the need to pull out your phone and double check that you're taking the most efficient route or whatever it may be. Um, I think there's definitely lots of benefits from being disconnected from the internet. And I wish that I had the courage to do it more often. Um, but one of the benefits, I guess, can be being social with people around you. Um, there's, there's lots of them, yeah. Yeah, really, I have, yeah, it's super uh, recognizable what you just chat and said. And just um, to be honest, like one and a half weeks ago, I got my first fine for um, looking up, <laughs> looking at Google on the electronic device as a police report said it cost me 109 uh, euros but yeah oh, it's it's not allowed so yeah um it's really hard to not look at your phone um so uh thank you dasha next question um is to geert do you think that being disconnected is the new luxury? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, it's the title, in fact, of um, um, a um, documentary. Um, I think it's available on um, uh, YouTube, but I'm not really sure. It's from the Dutch television, um, uh, VPRO, uh, Tegelicht. Um, yeah, in uh, uh, there, there you you uh, get to visit uh, some of the you know offline uh, camps. Um, what well, what is more interesting here is uh, is uh, that uh, this luxury is indeed something you know for the very rich uh, of you know, whom we know that they have already uh, delegated um, their online life pretty much to um, you know social media marketing uh, agencies uh, who do uh, you know their insta who uh, take uh, pictures and post them who uh, compose uh, edit and then uh, you know put their tweets uh, in a in a queue and um, uh, really negotiate and uh, measure very carefully um, depending on the time of day, the weather and uh, where this person is uh, so that uh, just before nine o'clock uh, something goes out, right? So it's, it's this kind of uh, delegation or automation, you, know, you could also say, done by uh, computers. Um, and then I mean computers really in the old most old-fashioned uh, uh, definition, namely uh, a woman who is uh, who is typing um, uh, and programming. Um, so yeah, the offline uh, we uh, we need to be a little bit uh, uh, skeptical of it, even though you know it might be very good huh? health-wise, uh, but you know as a as a pedagogy as a as a 
therapy, we really need uh, we need to be very cautious and question uh, the specific uh, agenda behind it. Thank you, Geert, for your uh, clear explanation. Um, and we're ready for the next question because we're running a bit out of time. Um, next question goes to Annika. Do you find digital technologies stressful? Well, I would say yes, to a certain degree, um, as in that actually I feel they're oftentimes still not as intuitive, even though they work very much with our unconscious um, response systems, they're still not so intuitive. And uh, I sometimes really struggle with that because I'm very impatient. Um, and I feel that actually a lot of the, okay, so there's a lot of time and speed gained through the use of digital technologies. But at the same time, I also feel we sometimes get stuck or I get stuck in the maze, obviously, of, um, of I think, yeah, simply superfluous um, steps and also obviously superfluous information, which depending on my daily mood, stresses me because I get entangled. If I'm very chill, I won't. So ultimately, it's my ability, it depends on my ability to, to deal with it, how stressed I get. Yeah, But um, of course, there are elements in it that I find stressful or that can be stressful. Thank you, Annika. Um, I completely agree. Um, so the next question goes to Teos, Sofia. What approach should one take when trying to redesign the internet? Or should we even aim for a change? this is a, a tough one um well basically i don't think it's it's actually up to designers i mean definitely designers can help facilitate uh making a, a less addictive environment um but it's actually something that's stimulated from top in a sense that it's um if if the uh, interaction and uh, if staying online is basically earning money then that, that is going to be the, the goal of a company, uh, of yeah, big tech uh, companies such as uh, Facebook or, or Twitter um, uh, or, or similar um, uh, social networks. Um, so probably when redesigning internet uh, designers would have to have a different goal in mind and that is to uh, inform people, educate people, pr provide them with, with useful information, but not make them uh, hooked. Uh, and um, what we see at the moment is that designers are doing their job really well because they're making us all really uh, hooked up. Uh, but yeah, as I said, I don't think it's uh, their uh, decision. They're just uh, enabling, although there is there is a responsibility uh, to to doing that, of course, uh, but they're enabling uh, the decisions from, from uh, higher ups. Thank you, Sophia. And we go to the next question, and that one is for Roos. What does doing nothing mean for you? What does the place where you can do nothing look like? Well, that's nice because I uh, differentiate between doing nothing online and doing nothing offline. And I would say doing nothing online would be 
looking at memes on Reddit or on YouTube and doing nothing offline would be either laying in bed while being awake or being at the sauna and finding relaxation in some sort of way. Oh yeah, I wish that saunas were open now or yes, completely. We were, it would be so nice um, because they're closed because of the corona, obviously. Um, so we go to the next question and that one goes to Vanessa. Can we blame technology for burnouts? Hi, uh, good morning everyone from, from Melbourne. Um, I've been online since 5 a.m. this morning, which feels very fitting for the occasion. Um, I mean, I think we should blame capitalism for burnouts. Um, I think, you know, technological platforms are essentially the instruments of capitalism, which leave us, lead us to believe that all of our time has to be spent very productively. Um, and that we have to always be switched on and that we have to monetize our habits. Um, so, of course, digital technologies give us the tools to be productive all of the time, to monetize our hobbies and engage with capitalism in particular ways. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's very important to recognize um, the economic system behind uh, the web and the particular behaviors that it condones and supports and suddenly addiction or productivity habits as I might prefer to call them are um, condoned by the by the broader system that that we live in and I think um, in my research I'm very much looking at how um, artists are useful in terms of their uh, ways of sub subverting some of those more productive um, approaches to technology and using digital technologies in ways that are sort of non-productive or less productive, um, more reflective and meditative and less about filtering our actions through those quite narrow um, sort of linear patterns towards productivity. Thank you, and uh, sorry that you had to wake up so early this morning. Um, we're still living in the past for you. Um, so the next question goes to Katriona. Can you come up with a metaphorical way of describing your internet habits? Well, um, my life is very confined to the domestic at the moment. So it's going to be a 100% unglamorous metaphor to do with washing up. And I feel like my internet habits are basically like a load of dirty dishes and I just wash them. And then straight away, I eat off them and they're dirty again. And it's like this, torturous cycle at the moment that makes me think I'm literally losing my mind so there you go <laughs> and plus you get a dirty laugh at the end <laughs> that's a sad aware laugh and I completely understand what you mean it's super recognizable thanks for sharing um and so we go to the next question and that's for Dasha What is the link between the popularity of mindfulness and the internet? Um, I think, well, a lot of things that we already talked about tonight throughout these questions are definitely make a link between the popularity of mindfulness and the internet in the sense that um, as soon as social networks became a big thing and then you know as soon as people started being or people's habits or people's data started being uh, exploited obviously um, 
the easiest way to also sell something that would relieve people from uh, the stress of technology would be through mindfulness. So through digital detox sessions or through um, um, digital yoga or yoga from away from being away from technology, which is um, ironically a video that I also have, but <laughs> we won't talk about that now. But I think the, yeah, the link is just that it's uh, yet another product that you can sell that also kind of counteracts um, what technology, um, are, you know, creates in us the, the sort of feelings that technology awakens in us that we don't like. Thank you, Dasha. Okay, and we go to the uh, final question before moving to the bar. Um, and the final question is to Vanessa. Do you ever think of an email you needed to finish when you were having sex? I've really drawn the short straw here with this one, haven't I, in a live setting. Um, I, I think I probably have, to be honest, although I'm certainly not going to mention any names and it wasn't Gerald's twin brother. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's an insider joke between the speakers. Um, look, I mean, you know, technology is designed to intrude upon our innermost intimate moments. And um, so, of course, I don't think anyone should should blame themselves um, if they, uh, yeah, if they are having trouble separating their intimate lives and their work lives, because I think, um, yeah, the online platforms are designed to facilitate and support that. And I think, um, yeah, we tend to kind of uh, take responsibility as individuals for things like distraction. Um, but actually, you know, we are living in a world, as I was saying before, that facilitates particular kinds of behaviours and particular kinds of interactions. So I think some, um, yeah, it's not the person's fault, basically, that I was thinking about an email while I was having sex with them. <laughs> okay, thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, okay, so we run, we run a bit out of time. Um, so we have to stop here, but we would love to um, invite you and see you all in uh, the Zoom bar. So um, thank you all. Thank you all uh, contributors for contributing to the project and for being here, especially when it's so early in the morning. Thank you for being here, um, spending your precious time behind the screen with us uh, while you're already looking at, at the screen so many times uh, a day. And I hope you liked it. And I want to invite you for the next event at Impact. And that's gonna be on uh, the 11th of uh, March, a pres presentation and live a Q and A with cyborg artist and activist um, Neil Harbison, who is best known for being the first person in the world with an antenna implanted in his skull, and for being legally uh, recognized as a cyborg by the British uh, government. The event um, is part of the Impact Web project uh, Cyborg Futures. Who doesn't want to live? forever um, that investigates the role of cyborgs, um, artificial intelligence and uh, robotics in um, today's world. So for more information, um, you can go to uh, impact.nl. So now it's time to go to the bar, finally. So put on your best Zoom filters and uh, pour yourself a drink. Um, and uh, the link is in the description or you can scan the QR uh, code with your uh, phone or with your eye implants if you're already a cyborg and um, yeah you can also find the link of the uh, zoom uh, bar on the description of the YouTube uh, event in case you're running late so thank you all again and uh, hope to see you there bye